I'm Robert from OC CISSP with Synopsys. And I'm Chris Clark with Synopsys. And today we're talking about the ISO 262. So uh, what we're looking at is the electrical and the electronics and the electrical systems within a vehicle that's on the road. And it gets pretty granular actually. So how does security play into this, either in hardware or software, Chris? Well, it's actually kind of a, a very important topic when we talk about ISO 26262. So we're talking about three different components when we discuss 26262. We're talking about the overall system, we're talking about the hardware components that make that system, and then we're talking about the software and that all-encompassing environment. And when we talk about security, there are factors that come into security. We talk about things such as safety, we talk about things such as quality, but overall when we tie all that together, we want a safe vehicle. And that's where 26262 really comes into play. We, looked at safety, we look at safety critical components that make that vehicle up and how it's going to function over time. So to give a little perspective, this predated the, the extensive use of computing systems in cars. This was functioning on a, on a safety level for the electrical systems when we're talking about like power windows and turning on the headlights and things like that, not necessarily computing. Uh, exactly. I mean, we're historically used to, we have a car that has a carburetor and a transmission and all those independent uh, components work independently of each other. Yes, there's linkages and there's other pieces and parts, but those are more physical interactions. Now in our modern vehicles, not only do we have to look at those physical interactions, we have to look at the software interactions, the physical components themselves. And because they're so intertwined now, we have to really take a look at if a component fails or behaves in an unexpected manner, how do we handle that? What do we do with that? And that's where 262 really comes into play, especially when we start talking about ASIL levels and other components related to Right, 26262. And can you explain ASIL briefly? Sure. So uh, when we talk about ASIL levels, it's a level of determination of how critical or how safety critical is that component and the level of redundancy and checking to ensure that that device is working as, as intended. So a good example might be something where we look at a brake controller. Mm -hmm. And there's multiple components that make up that overall braking system, but there's a computer somewhere that's running that brake controller uh, or th those brakes in general. And if that brake controller is to fail, does that fail in a safe manner? Does that still allow me to apply brakes? If a, another component is sending erroneous messages to that brake controller, does that brake controller have the logic to ignore those messages because it put, could put the, safe, the vehicle in an unsafe condition? Right. So it's, it's a rather complicated process, and really where we start to look at that is that individual component, and we assign a different levels of criticality to the devices that make up that overall vehicle. And that's where those ASO levels starts to come, start to come into play. Right, and A being the lowest and D being being the highest. The most critical. Yes. Right, exactly. So once again, just for context, um, this isn't an old standard. It's a relatively modern standard. Mm -hmm. But my point is, is that its origin was in the electrical systems that were rather primitive at one point in time. How are they addressing the more modern needs? Is this standard holding up pretty well? Well, the original standard that we're referring to, 61508, mm -hmm. really just looked at how individual components interact in a vehicle, but they're still standalone. Now we look at not only from a, a 262 perspective, not only are they standalone, they're interconnected, and right. how that functionality impacts their overall vehicle safety. So. 262 is is relatively new from a standards perspective. You know, when we talk about standards, they take many years to develop. Right. They're, they're not uh, something we just throw together over a weekend and we say, okay, everything's good. We really have to take our time in how we look at that overall development, what encompasses that, that uh, particular standard. So 26262 has really become more of a industry-wide standard on how we handle safety-critical systems within a vehicle. It's become very popular and it's very critical. And I'd be surprised if, if many of our viewers have not already started talking about or right. have been talking about 262 for some time now. Right. So it's, uh, it's a standard that's going to be along for a while. It's in uh, very active development. So as new technologies come into play, such as uh, vehicle sensor synthesis and other capabilities, 262 is coming along to help address those issues. So who is enforcing it? There are a number of standards that are out there. Is it industry adopted? Are the OEMs pushing it down to the tier one, tier twos? Or is there a regulatory body that's saying you must abide by this? So really the interesting about the automotive industry is we do see the automotive industry really focus on how they 
uh, implement standards themselves. They're, they're self-regulating. They, they do a lot of work in that respect. But they do have a lot of regulatory oversight. So uh, when we look at NHTSA, DOT, and other organizations that revolve around the automotive industry, they do have regulatory requirements to meet there uh, in, in that respect. But really, the automotive industry does a good job of regulate, regulating itself, ensuring that it's doing the right thing from a, a standards perspective and a right. safety perspective. So, yes. Right. Is there something equivalent to ISO 262? Uh, not really. 262 is really a unique animal. There are some other standards out there that started to touch on some of the safety challenges related to the systems uh, that make up not only automotive, but also aerospace industry. Uh, but 262 really is a standard that stands unique, uh, especially from an adoption standpoint. Right. Uh, in the automotive industry, there really is nothing else that, that lines up and is as encompassing as 26262. Uh, like I said earlier, when we talk about safety, we look. We have to look at that system, but before we look at that entire system, we have to look at those individual components, and that's where 262 really shines. There are specific requirements from a hardware perspective, there are specific requirements from a software perspective, and then an overall system, which is what m many other standards that have attempted to do what 26262 uh, just could not achieve. Right. So or have not achieved. So back to my original question, um, we talk a lot about the safety, and that's how it was designed. And, and in many ways, the automotive industry has always been focused on safety and reliability of their vehicles. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're driving 70 miles an hour down the freeway, <laughs> you don't want to have a failure of any kind. And then when you start to add chips into it, when you start to add logic into it, that becomes even more important. So how does security play with safety? Is it a subset of that? Or because you've got safety, now you've got security? Well, so for for those of the viewers who are very familiar with security, they're, for, they're familiar with the term the CIA, not the CIA that does monitoring spoofs it's and all that stuff. Confidentiality, confidentiality integrity, integrity, and availability, exactly. Yes. So when we talk about safety, we have to also look at quality as a major component of the, the safety component and security. So those are the three triads that kind of make up the ISO 262. Sorry, 26262. So... Uh, from a, a security perspective, we have to understand you can't just have security. You know, security for the sake of security isn't going to uh, provide a safe vehicle. It right. may make a vehicle that we can't open the doors, or if our key fob gets lost, we can never start the vehicle again. But from a quality standpoint and, uh, and addressing the functionality of safety for that vehicle, they all have to work together. So they're right. an equal triad in, in that respect. And that's where 26262 has really helped to ensure that when we talk about the quality of the components that make up that vehicle, there is an, an a built-in security component. But we still have to go to that next level of looking at that overall system and that interaction to look right. for unintended consequences when we're going through that development process. We may ensure that from a safety perspective, there is never a fault condition that causes a danger to the vehicle. But that doesn't necessarily implement or mean that an attacker couldn't leverage one of those components. Right. And that we're, that's where security sits on top of that. Right. And building on top of 26262, we have to take that into account. So looking at the chip level, you'd want to consider things like uh, fast reboot. Secure boot. Secure boot. You don't want other uh, firmware updates and things to intrude upon the operation of the vehicle while it's in operation. Exactly. Especially when we start seeing over-the-air updates come into play. Once over-the-air is available to us and it's much more prevalent, that's something we're really going to have to take into account. What does that secure boot process? What does that fast boot process? Does that mean we have different states when that vehicle is uh, in a driving mode mm -hmm. versus in a parked mode? And there's a software update or a software fault condition that's occurred, and we have to take action based off of that. ISO 26262 mm -hmm. also creates a situation where we're having to rethink some of the chip designs. So in the past, you know, we've, we've had chips that did a certain thing, but now we're requiring them to have a certain level of redundancy. Right. such as having two operations performed at the exact same time and being able to mediate between, you know, incorrect answers there. Right. Uh, is that a result of uh, some of the stuff we see, or is that a different standard or a different requirement? Um, I think it's more of a requirement. When we okay. look at the chips that are being implemented and what's being asked of the silicon and the software that's going on top of that silicon, there's a level of requirement and development that goes around what that functionality is. Now, once we've defined that functionality and we have a process in place for um, 
developing that overall system, that's where we have to take a look into the ASO levels or the 26262 levels that make a determination of risk for that component. So let's say we do have a multi-core processor and it's handling multiple functions in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. We have to initially define what that risk level is uh, for a specific function for that specific component. And then based off of that, we can take action on how we address that over time uh, and as part of the development process or capabilities of those chips. Right. And do we look at, do we do some form of locking? Do we go into a single thread mode? Do we, you know, all these different components that could be leveraged, we have to make determinations based on process and requirements uh, to move forward with it or, or to select the right process that ensures one safety and security. Right. And then moving on to the firmware, the software part of it, um, there are various things that need to be checked there as well. And so some of the operations that we've talked about before, some of the tests that we've talked about before would be, for example, fuzzing. Sure. So, fuzzing, penetration testing, all of those are still completely applicable when we talk about 26262. But they're addressing that security component. When we're talking about the safety component, mm -hmm. we still have to understand those are a level of, of abstraction away from 26262 itself. Right. But they're required in order to maintain that triad that we were talking about before, the quality, safety, and security of the component. So the, the risk that's identified in ISO 262 would be failure? Typically, something okay. that's going to go into a failure mode that could potentially harm the individuals in the vehicle or allow the vehicle to perform some level of harm or that crashes, loss of control, whatever it may be. <clears throat> but the, the level of 26262 is not defined to uh, the vehicle. It's level, uh, defined to the level of a component. So wow. as we were talking about before, I could have 30 different computers in a vehicle that all have different ASIL levels. Right. They don't all have to be the highest or the exactly. best. Exactly. It That's depends right. on their role and their criticality. Exactly. Okay. What, what damage or harm could they impose if their safety parameters are right. exceeded? So it really becomes a complex process when we look at overall vehicle design. We have to look at many different levels and many different areas of that overall vehicle. So, again, you could have a variety of different ASIL Levels. results, mm -hmm. and that's okay because it depends what the final end product is right. for that. And it's actually pretty important to see that we have different ASIL levels because if the assumption is made all components have to be ASIL critical. level D, critical, uh, we're going to have a very expensive vehicle with probably not very good functionality. <laughs> right. And so this is where the assessment of risk comes back into it. It's like how much of a hazard would this pose if it were a lower ASIL level? Exactly. And what's the level of risk? What's the level of risk? And just briefly on the ASILs, they're pretty specific or they're pretty general? Um, they're pretty specific in their level of definition. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a matter of interpreting the requirements for the component that is under development and risk categories are being measured for and the software that's going to be encompassing in that particular component. So there is a level of interpretation uh, which is true of many standards. But in this case, it's really up to the organization to focus on it, uh, making the determination of what components, what software, and how they're going to validate and test those. So when we look at tools such as uh, components and tools provided by Synopsys, we provide a lot of that information for them already. So especially when we're talking about silicon or intellectual right. property, we've, lot, we've done a lot of that determination. And then you have that testing component that comes into it. Right. But there's a level of interpretation that has to occur, and that's going to be done by the OEM or the tier provider. And it will be driven by requirements uh, given by the OEM as well. Okay. Thank you, Chris. As always, you can continue the dialogue with us by joining us at faultinjection at synopsis.com. And you can also check out our automotive content at synopsis.com slash automotive. For Fault Injection, I'm Robert Vimosi. And I'm Chris Clark. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you the next time.